present on Linux now? We can just do that, and it's not a big deal. Our next talk is by James. Take it away, James. Hey. Uh, thank you. So uh, welcome to my talk, uh, Unsafe de Defaults, uh, Deploying Kubernetes Kinda Safer-ish. Uh, I'm James. Uh, I'm human, and therefore I'm a moron by default. Uh, I work in InfoSec in Tokyo, uh, which, as everyone in New Zealand knows, is located in China, uh, alongside Blizzard these days. Uh, <laughs> but my uh, nameless and completely unassociated employer, uh, employer for this talk uh, is also kind of looking for people in InfoSec that want to work in Tokyo. So uh, if that's you, just come find me later and have a chat. We'll see, uh, see what your interests are. Um, but just quickly as well, I'd like to clean up just like one other geographic confusion um, that's very recently occurred. Uh, as you can see by this map, we are in Wellington. And uh, my luggage, however, is still in Sydney. Um, so this might not be news to you as experts, um, but this seems to have gotten the better of a company that's like apparently their whole job is moving people and stuff from like one predetermined location to another. Um, so who knows? Maybe I will um, get some, I'll get my luggage back. But if you're sitting next to me in the audience later, uh, and you find yourself thinking like, "Man, this guy's clothes really smell like the 30th row in a 737 800," <laughs> um, I know, buddy. I know. So anyway, uh, I've been testing the security of some Kubernetes deployments recently, and I thought I'd give a really quick talk on some of that. Um, so the first thing that a lot of people seem to ask is, so like, what is this Kubernetes thing anyway? Well, this should hopefully be immediately clear to everyone. Uh, so thanks for coming to my talk. <laughs> uh, but seriously, uh, I'm going to spend about the next seven minutes just quickly running you through what Kubernetes is and uh, how to go about installing it. Um, and it's going to be quite an injustice because it's a big complex thing. And then I'll spend the next seven minutes just giving you a quick uh, like easy wins on how to make it much more secure than the defaults. Um, please understand that this is a little bit like how to build a race car in seven minutes, and then how to drive a race car in the next seven minutes. But let's just power straight into it with the same reckless abandon as a Qantas baggage handler. <laughs> <laughs> so in the middle of Kubernetes, there is an API. Uh, and this is super important. Uh, you probably know that Kubernetes has something to do with containers already. Uh, both the containers, well, the containers are defined by configuration. You'll typically see this as Docker files. Um, the Kubernetes API is also commonly interacted with uh, through configuration. In Kubernetes, uh, the configuration you provide is used to create policies, and Kubernetes itself will change its state to meet these policies. Uh, for example, a policy might be always have three web servers running. Uh, and if there's not enough running, Kubernetes will start more containers to meet that uh, policy. Uh, so one of its components is actually a state machine. Uh, we've already heard a little bit about those today. Uh, so Kubernetes itself is an orchestrator. Uh, it tells the system what to do before, during, and after running these containers. So it has this concept of managing the entire life cycle of an application. Uh, people say it's like from birth to death of your containers. Uh, and it's pretty complex. There's a lot of parts to Kubernetes that make up the application as a whole. And you get to say DevOps a lot, which is either nice or terrible, depending on your perspective. Uh, and it was originally designed by Google. Uh, you've probably heard things like everything at Google runs in a container, uh, and that Google starts 2 billion containers per week. That's like over 3,000 containers per second, all, like every second for a week. Um, it's the evolution of a system that they called Borg. Um, and that was the system they built to design how the heck you go about running two billion containers a week. Uh, but from a security perspective, the API is like the good stuff. That if you can own that, you own the entire cluster. So you need to defend it really, really well. So some general concepts about Kubernetes, and this is like apologies to anyone in the audience who actually really understands Kubernetes because this is going to be super generalized and it's going to hurt you. Uh, but in general, you should have a master node, uh, which runs most of the core Kubernetes stuff, and you should have at least one worker node, which uh, runs your workloads. Uh, you make an a API request of the service that runs on the master node, and based on its configuration and policies, uh, it can do actions for you on the worker nodes. Uh, in this case, uh, deploy an app or a container. So Kubernetes deploys pods. Uh, these are groups of containers that make up an application as a whole. 
within a microservices architecture. Uh, and the easy way to remember this is think like pod of whales, right? It's just a Docker joke. Um, and again, these are uh, defined through configuration. So you can pipe YAML or JSON files off disk or you know, off pastebin if you really feel game. Um, and that will then have the system go and uh, deploy an app for you. You can also scale your apps easily. So Kubernetes, uh, like if you edit your configuration files, you can say um, you, know, you want three web servers to be running to run your cat blogs, uh, and Kubernetes will create more of them to meet the scale. Uh, in this case, maybe that's too many, right? So because Kubernetes is really def de uh, targeted at orchestration of more servers than a human can reasonably manage, uh, most clusters you will see will have far more than one worker node in them. Um, and Kubernetes will look at the existing workload and evenly distribute uh, the workloads that you're trying to put onto it into the gaps, and it does all that management, um, resource allocation, all that stuff. So in order to understand what we're actually up against, like, uh, I'll just quickly run through looking at how we go about uh, installing Kubernetes. And mostly it's just garbage, <laughs> right? We, I see all the time just curl, pipe this thing into sudo bash, and we know that is bad. Uh, the modern equivalent seems to be using Ansible playbooks. Ansible's a tool for going and installing software on remote systems. And uh, again, like people just say, oh, yeah, just curl this YAML file in. Um, and sometimes people say, in order to make Kubernetes run, you need to make a sacrifice to whatever deity you choose. Um, but these days, there's, like, you can mostly apt get install it, but that's not finished the installation. That's just getting the packages that you require. So here's an example of how not to build uh, secure, strong infrastructure um, or another. Uh, K3S is like the Raspberry Pi version, um, and that comes from how to build a production-ish cluster. <laughs> is anyone here running uh, Kubernetes at home on like a Raspberry Pi cluster? A couple of hands, yeah, OK. Are you also spawning 2 billion containers a week at home? No? <laughs> no, OK. Um, but uh, so Kubernetes often uses Docker as a container runtime, so you need Docker too. So you have to go to the Docker documentation, and uh, then they tell you to curl, pipe, bash as well. Um, uh, to be fair, they do say you should read it, um, but who does? Um, or you could follow some like one-liner on a Medium article, or you could read someone's GitHub, or you could follow Hacker News. Uh, this one here is probably my favorite because it actually tells you that because it's using HTTPS, it's secure. <laughs> so you can do this. That, that's just fine. Uh, as a community, right, it is overwhelmingly clear that we are setting ourselves up for failure and that we are letting each other down. Um, some of this is the beginnings and the causes of some of the problems that I'll uh, continue to elaborate on. But if you are going to deploy a new cluster or you're going to audit someone's existing cluster and help them make it more secure, um, please follow the official documentation. Uh, it helps you get a really full picture of all of the parts that are moving in there, even if it is uh, quite overwhelming to start with. Uh, and if you're, yeah, especially checking someone else's cluster, ask them, how did you set this up, right? Do you understand the components that are in it? Did you curl, pipe, bash um, off the internet? But that's enough about setup. So let's look at it actually running. Um, this really could be a three-hour talk, um, and we wouldn't cover everything. So I'm going to give you just a couple of quick, easy wins. Um, again, this isn't comprehensive, but I know lunch is next, and we're all getting hungry, so we're going to power through. Uh, the API, uh, by default, it serves on two different ports. It binds to localhost on port 8080, uh, and it binds to the first non-localhost adapter with HTTPS. By default, though, that localhost bound port uses no TLS, it uses no authentication, and it has no authorization checks either. So if someone manages to pop a shell on your master node, they require no further information to be able to talk to that API and do whatever they want with it. Um, so this is one of the really, really good reasons why they put those big scary warnings saying, do not run your WordPress cat blog containers on your master node. Uh, because it will get popped, and then someone will just have a field there with your entire cluster. Um, but this is also sometimes seen in test deployments, right, where people aren't sure about what Kubernetes is and how it all works. So they're just like, oh, I just want to put everything on the single VM, and we'll just make it work and disable a bunch of checks and all that kind of stuff. Um, the second port uses TLS, requires authentication, um, all the stuff that you're typically expecting. 
the authentication and authorization in Kubernetes does go through a process before your request gets executed. Um, so the three main stages are the authentication, the authorization, and the admission control. So authentication, you all know what that is. It's typically done with passwords, certificates, or tokens. Uh, authorization comes from your policies. So you say, can this user do these things? Can this service account do these actions? Um, and that will check after you've identified yourself. Uh, typically, this is RBAC. Um, and then the admission control is like an extra plugins group of things that you can add in to uh, give extra security modules to verify and validate requests that are coming in. Um, and this is typically all done with TLS, but when you deploy it from startup, uh, it's self-signed certificates. So a lot of the checks on the validity of those certificates are kind of bypassed. Uh, but you don't always have to go through this authentication dance either. Uh, Kubernetes tolerates unauthenticated users, and it'll bind them to different groups and roles within RBAC, um, and that changes based on the version of the cluster. It's worth checking and possibly stripping permissions away from the default, uh, because sometimes it gives more than you would actually expect it to. Uh, just for reference as well, the latest version is 1.16. This speaks about 1.14, which is not that long ago. Uh, I was writing these slides at 1.15, and they released a new version like two weeks ago, and yeah, it was, I had to go and update a bunch of things. Uh, so instead of authenticating to this API uh, with username or password, uh, there's also tokens, and these are typically used for service accounts. Uh, Kubernetes uses a lot of these internally because it has a lot of machine components that you don't want to have to pre-program in usernames and passwords for and then keep them securely on disk or whatever else. Uh, as a general rule, these tokens expire every 24 hours, and they're rotated automatically by Kubernetes. Um, there used to be a type of forever token as well, uh, that ran whenever a pod was deployed with a service account, uh, and it didn't expire. So when attackers got their hands on those, they were gold because they could just do whatever they wanted with them. This has been removed from new deployments, but it still exists out there quite a lot, uh, mainly because rotating them is a total pain, and uh, you have to like delete the service that's associated with it and all the secrets that were stored with that token, and no one did it unless they really, really had to do it. Uh, also, everyone gets a token. By default, in Kubernetes, when you deploy a container, Kubernetes will mount a token into that container for you. And it won't tell you that it's done it, unless you go and read the documentation. So, here's the fancy words that back up that completely outrageous claim. Uh, the token itself uh, allows the container it was given to the ability to communicate back to that Kubernetes API within the namespace that it exists in and make requests of it. So this is really useful if your container needs to interact with Kubernetes. Maybe it reports the load on your application, or maybe it's like a load balancer and it needs to get you know, a query for the IP address of its child containers that it needs to redirect traffic to, or whatever the case may be. But there's a very good chance that by default you don't require that functionality for the pods that you're deploying. So if you're unaware of this, um, maybe you should go and revoke them because by default the service accounts give more privilege than you're probably comfortable with. Uh, but fortunately, in your container, it's protected with chmod 777, which means that absolutely anyone in the container can read that token. Uh, and it will even tell you what namespace you're working in. Um, I don't have too much time to go into namespaces, but uh, you can probably see that the credentials is just a, a JSON web token, a JWT, uh, and the default namespace itself is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so when you're deploying a, uh, a application in Kubernetes, you say, this is the namespace I want it to go into, and you have to have the appropriate authorization and access to said namespace. But if you just forget to put one in, in your YAML file, if you just didn't type namespace blah, uh, it will end up in default. And uh, sometimes in large complex clusters, this ends up being a bit of a dumping ground of like all of those leftover bits from other projects that people haven't quite got set up right. Uh, and in def uh, by default, you get three different namespaces. You get default, you get cube public, which anyone can access, even unauthenticated. There's some fun happens there. And cube system, which contains all of the Kubernetes components by default. So here is how you disable that. Um, I know everyone loves looking at slides of YAML, uh, but you can probably see it's just a very simple file, and the critical information you require is to say auto mount service account token is false. Uh, you can then just apply that, and you have to apply it for every namespace. Maybe by now, though, you're wondering like, what you can actually do with this token. Um, 
So uh, assume an attacker uh, pops a shell in your WordPress cat blog container. Uh, they can go and read this file and then talk to the Kubernetes API and create more containers of their own or delete your containers or spawn Bitcoin mining containers or go and download Kali as a container and pop that in your thing and run it as root. Uh, and then, you know, so on and so forth onto great nasty things. Uh, importantly, though, they are no longer constrained to that one container, right? They've gained both horizontal and vertical privilege escalation in being able to access the orchestrator that uh, is within the large environment. So here's a new thing. This is pretty neat. This is called the pod security policy. Uh, it's a cluster level resource that uh, controls the security aspects of the cluster. Um, it allows you to define a bunch of rules uh, and conditions that a pod must uh, accept in order to be able to run on your cluster. Um, and it lets you also define defaults for uh, a lot of these controls. So it means you can restrict uh, what user a pod is allowed to run as or what group they're allowed to run as. Uh, it allows you to prevent them from running as root, which is pretty nice. By default, a lot of containers will spawn as root. Uh, it lets you say what the file permissions are that they can access. Uh, can, uh, can they run as privilege mode? A privileged container can mount like WAC dev and WAC proc of the host into the container, which definitely doesn't sound like a way that you could privilege escalate at all. Um, and it can prevent you from running set UID binaries and all of those kind of things. Uh, it is in beta. It's not enabled by default. It relies on really strong RBAC to put some constraints around this. So you do have to make sure you've got your RBAC set up properly as well. We've already had a talk a bit about uh, some of that identity management stuff. And it's pretty important that you do keep an eye on this. Um, and much like you would with your authentication logs, right? Look at the logs of what policies uh, are allowing and denying. Because if you're getting repeated failures against your pod security policy, there's a good chance that someone does have a presence on your cluster somewhere. Remember, the call is coming from inside the house. They've managed to get onto your system somehow. Um, if you're keeping an eye on your logs, uh, you will know when someone is trying to work out what they can and can't do within your cluster. Uh, again, I know everyone loves YAML. Uh, Here's a starting policy you can apply. You can get these slides from the great archive later, so don't worry about like, trying to frantically write all this down. Um, but I will point out just a few couple of points in here because it's all good stuff. So like I said earlier, privileged account can mount like WAC dev, WAC proc, speak to the network and all that kind of stuff. Um, definitely disable that one like just right off the board. Anyone that ne needs a privileged container should be able to justify why they need a privileged container. Uh, allow privilege escalation is an interesting one as well. Uh, it prevents the container from running set UID binaries and from enabling extra capabilities from themselves because otherwise the config can just say, oh, well, please allow me to run set UID binaries and give me that capability. Uh, run as user and must run as non-root are two really good things, right? It, uh, you can specify a range of UUIDs um, and you know, group IDs to run as. Um, and uh, the same thing for um, uh, supplemental groups as well. You don't want containers to say, oh, I want to start as UID 1000, but also just add root as a group for me. Uh, this alone is insufficient to prevent total privilege escalation. Like within your cluster, you also have to protect your file systems and your capabilities and networking and all and so forth. But there is a link at the bottom, like go and read that page. Um, so one other component that's in Kubernetes is etcd. This is your highly available uh, key value store when you're running your Kubernetes master with more than three different nodes. Uh, it's often typically just installed on one node, so it's not that highly available after all. Uh, it's also very sensitive to things like disk latency and I.O. contention. So an attacker can very easily denial of service this particular component and then just stop your whole cluster from working. Uh, this contains the actual and desired state of Kubernetes. So it holds lots of configs, it holds lots of certificates, lots of keys. Uh, as a general rule, anything that you read from kubectl, the program to interact with Kubernetes from your terminal, uh, comes from etcd. And the contents of this key value store database are encrypted on disk using highly like uncrackable military grade base64. Uh, it also runs as a network service, which means it listens on port 2379. Uh, and write access to this system is basically root, right? Because attackers will just start shoving their own keys in there. They'll end up in containers. They'll end up on hosts. 
and then they'll just SSH right in like a regular admin. Uh, even just read access to this is like the easiest privesk you will ever give an attacker because it's like, oh, I can see all your config and I know what traps I'm going to fall into and I can spot ways around it. So definitely lock this down more than the default. Uh, for those playing at home, try running this against your cluster and just see how much information it spits out. Um, so you can also protect etcd with authentication. Sounds like a nice idea. Also not done by default. So you should probably put a username and a password on this system. Uh, it typically only needs ever to be accessed by the Kubernetes uh, internals itself, right? Unless you're connecting to larger, greater systems that are going to share this key value system for some reason. Maybe it's a, you're using an external product instead. Um, it's typically quite easy to lock down to just the Kubernetes APIs and uh, the internal components. You can actually also encrypt it on disk now um, from version 1.13 onwards. Uh, you can do like AES and GCM and all that kind of stuff, um, PKCS7, all that. Um, and, but also remember to back it up, right, because this is the core of your cluster. Um, you could also maybe restrict this with a firewall. Like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but I can't say much more than this when like, you go to the official Kubernetes documentation and you say, like, how do I secure Kubernetes? And it's like the first thing that they tell you, right? It's like just lock this thing down and maybe things will be a little better. So how do you not get owned in 30 seconds? Well, this is one of those times where complexity hinders security, and it tends to favor the attacker all the time. So we know that there will never be a perfectly secure cluster, unless it's you know, off and buried in concrete. Um, but it doesn't make it easy to default towards secure. So my recommendations to you would be, please read the documentation. Don't just apply random scripts from the intergoogles. Um, put some defenses around the API, so authenticate. Uh, authorization, try and restrict it as much as possible. Don't issue service tokens unless you really have to, um, especially not just by default, right? The people that need it can ask for it and you can put some config in, but otherwise you're basically just giving out free credentials to that API to every app that runs in your cluster. Uh, configure the pod security policies because otherwise any container can run with root privilege and root in a container is effectively root on the host and you're probably not giving out SSH root access to all of your hosts. Uh, encrypt your wonderful, highly available key value store that you totally deployed on more than one node, uh, both in rest uh, or in flight and at rest. Um, it does mean you need to go and set up certificates and HTTPS and validation and all that stuff, but then you can validate your clients and your peers and differentiate the two. Um, and it also means because you've done that, you've obviously set it up to more than one node. Uh, and also totally like back up your con shirts and bring a hoodie in your carry on because if Qantas loses your bag, then like that's all you've got. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, come see me over lunch um, or leave me a note in your nearest etcd. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>